bad news is that this heritage year has seen permission granted for the demolition of a listed building every day. That's 182 buildings in the first six months alone, twice the number of last year. Although we're listing more buildings for conservation these days, the alarming fact is that at this rate, we will lose 10,000 historic buildings in the next 25 years. A harrowing account of the threat to our heritage is published today in a special issue of the Architects' Journal. It's called The Save Report. It's by a group of devoted critics to whom Heritage Year is merely another occasion for British architects and planners to pat each other on the back. The role of dishonor that emerges from the report puts paid to any complacency that we've got much to celebrate. These are among the many buildings threatened or doomed. Chelsea, Tedworth Square. Worcester, Fourgate Street. Bridlington, Kirkgate. Plymouth, Nazareth House. Brighton, West Pier. Shropshire, Langley Hall. Staffordshire, Barliston Hall. Bolton, the Saviour. Northamptonshire, Ecton Hall. Cheshire, Hanforth Hall. Hull, Prince's Street. Why is this happening under what's been called the finest planning system in the world? We have the legal powers to save whatever buildings we have the will to keep. Since the Second World War, when the modern planning system was established, an official list of historic buildings has been drawn up, and any listed building that survived the Blitz should not be demolished without express permission from the local planning authority. Now this protection covers whole streets and districts, designated as conservation areas as well. It sounds good but there are loopholes big enough to drive a bulldozer through. First of all, there are thousands of beautiful buildings and streets of character not covered because of local resistance or disagreements about taste. So these can be demolished at will by their owners. So can redundant churches and the buildings owned by government departments. Those buildings that are officially protected can still be demolished by any one of three procedures. The simplest bypasses the whole protection system entirely. It usually goes like this. An unscrupulous developer buys a listed building. He lets it purposely decay until a building inspector condemns it as a dangerous structure. Now he can pull it down at once, and at the risk of a modest fine, he has a cleared site. The second way is for the owner to apply to the local authority for permission to demolish, and for reasons we shall come to, it's often granted. But if this is refused, a third option remains. The owner can appeal and it's then up to the local authority to make the case for keeping the building up, not the owner for pulling it down. And even if he's still refused permission to demolish, the building isn't safe yet. The owner can compel the local authority to buy the house. In the end, to save ratepayers money, the council may prefer to pull it down themselves. So many local authorities try to avoid conservation altogether. Yet it's their job to propose buildings for listing to the Department of the Environment in the first place. Indeed, local councils are at the heart of the conservation system. So if their heart isn't in it, well, the results are the most worrying part of the SAVE report. This problem, who guards the guardians, is described by Simon Jenkins of the Sunday Times, one of the authors of the report. Once upon a time, we all regarded the private property developer as the chief villain in the destruction of good British architecture. Now that grim mantle has fallen on the local authority. For example, take a look at this. It's Highlands House, owned by Chelmsford Council in Essex. It's been rotting in the council's care for ten years, and despite two carefully costed schemes to restore it, the council have now asked the Department of the Environment to let them pull it down to grass over the site. Incidentally, even demolition will cost the ratepayers £15,000. As more buildings pass into public ownership, the danger to them is becoming steadily more serious. One third of the listed historic buildings proposed for demolition in this architectural heritage year are in the direct ownership of local authorities. And that should mean you and me. Those who should be gamekeepers of our architecture have turned poacher. But usually it's not neglect that's the trouble, it's dithering, particularly over planning decisions. 
causing the insidious condition known as planner's blight. Here at the Angel Islington, it's now ten years since the Greater London Council decided to drive a road through the area. It's now two years since they decided not to. Yet although the council still owns these buildings, no one lives or works in them. The community is getting no money from them in rent or rates, and everyone is having to put up with what's become a squalid eyesore. Perhaps the strangest irony is that in many towns, and especially in many villages, the role of protecting historic buildings has passed from the local council to the very people in whose name it claims to speak, the ratepayers and electors who form the rapidly growing conservation groups. When demolition actually becomes council policy, the fate of many buildings then depends not on the law, but on voluntary, unpaid effort. In Berkhamsted, it's four years since the local council took responsibility for the old town hall, on the understanding they'd restore it. Now they want to demolish it to make way for an office block. One group of citizens are so incensed by this, they've prepared architects' plans for its restoration at their own expense. The volunteers who've done some useful work here to help keep the weather out and above all to board the building up and to stop the vandals getting in, because the vandals have had a free run of the place for about three years, until Easter this year. And now the group's fighting to save the building, which is under threat of demolition. Well, it's, I'd say under any circumstances, I'd like to see it preserved because it's part of the past history and architecture of the town. There's precious little left. It adds variety to the high street, and most high streets have lost their variety in most English towns. And again, the front of this building is rather interesting because the architect who designed it was not mainstream in his day. He went and rather did his own thing. And uh, possibly another architect would have given them an absolutely symmetrical front. He's given them an asymmetrical front here and it's got all sorts of little details which are really nice. It's sort of modest, it's uh, the size, the proportions are sort of human. It was put up in, in 1859 by public subscription in order to be a community centre. There wasn't anything of the kind in Berkhamsted and it became a centre of education and enjoyment, social life of the town. And we reckon that it's possible to bring it back into use at an economic cost and to make it again something that Berkhamsted can be proud of. Local authority destruction of valuable old buildings reaches epic proportions when it comes to housing. Government grants since the war have been biased in favour of new housing blocks and in the process have swept away many perfectly sound old houses. In London alone, the GLC now admit that some 60% of the houses cleared between 1956 and 1971 could have been saved. That's 100,000 houses wasted. No wonder there's now a housing shortage. Conservation is dismissed out of hand as the concern of a middle-class minority anxious to keep the outsides of old buildings and indifferent to the living conditions within. In Froome, for example, in the West Country, the last corner of a district which the SAVE report calls of unique architectural character is now at risk. After 30 years of blight, the few local residents who are left have been inspired by a plan for rehabilitation that's half the price of new housing. They stopped the bulldozer a fortnight before it was due, at which the chairman of the housing committee promptly resigned. But the fate of more sound houses is still in the balance. all my life in this area. My feeling is it, it's had its use for life. I think too much is being played on the character of this area. To the people who live around this area and who've come out of this area, they're just houses, and that's the way I look at them, I'm afraid. The Trinity area is of immense historical and architectural importance to the town of Froome. Virtually all the buildings there date back to the late 17th and early 18th century. And uh, even though a lot have been altered in the 19th century, there are very, very few um, that haven't got traces going back that far. Two thirds of the area have already been demolished and redeveloped by um, the former local authority. And the new local authority has now produced plans for the redevelopment of the remaining five acres. And it was these five acres that we looked at in our rehabilitation scheme. I found it very difficult to accept that because 
of a pressure group, which uh, in my own mind is quite uh, all right in its way, but I felt that a council who are supposed to be responsible people taking responsible decisions should then completely change their mind, as I say, after three to four years of discussion. No one took a good look at the alternative to cost it, to see whether buildings which could be produced, could be improved, which would provide good homes, and certainly no thought was given to the future. Well, obviously, a council has one object in view, and that is the people on its housing list. Uh, and, of course, the housing department, of which really had mostly to do with this area than the full council, knew precisely what the people wanted and the people did not want to live, and do not want to live, in rehabilitated houses. I just can't see the reason for them wanting to pull it down. I think it's perfectly right as it is. Uh, well, they class it as a slum area, and actually, in fact, they call it as a Chinatown, um, for a simple reason that in the olden days it used to have narrow streets. Um, this day and age, majority of these old houses have been pulled down, and uh, we've got quite w wide streets, what's left of them. Um, I can't really see any reason at all uh, for the council not to uh, give us grants to do them up. Nobody really wants council houses. They all want these houses done up. I don't think that's a lot to ask the council. Uh, the area was always known to me before I went to Froome as Chinatown, and it still is. And it's a stigma that the people living there have had to live down. What the council houses the council want to put up are more or less the slums of tomorrow. Well, of course, I mean, that's a matter of opinion, isn't it? But I prefer my own house to any council house that's put up today. Now, the, the cost of redevelopment and rehabilitation uh, is such that there is virtually no argument about it. Um, the council's redevelopment scheme was costed at a million to a million and a half pounds. We costed our scheme out, and our figure has come out at something like half a million to three quarters of a million. If it could be proven to you that it was cheaper to rehabilitate the houses left in this area than to clear them and rebuild it, would you then consider rehabilitation? No, I would not. I come down strongly in favour of the plans that we approved and the houses that we had designed and put on. and. Um, I see nothing whatsoever in this area that is worth keeping. Such exchanges of old silk purses for new sow's ears are more than just economic or aesthetic nonsense. Each old house and street contains a host of family memories and attachments not easily replaced. And all this disruption is done in the public's name, apparently in their interest. Yet I can think of no other intrusion into our private lives that matches the compulsory purchase of good or repairable houses that people have lived in all their lives and spent hard-earned money to keep up. Here are some excerpts from a film Don Howarth made last year of what it felt like to the people of Morseside in Manchester to be uprooted from old but salvageable terraces and compulsorily rescued into a modern estate. What is wrong with our house to bring them down? Well, only really that it's in the grey areas, which is a good condition house, but it's in the way. You see, they can't leave, say, four or five houses up here and there, you see. Yeah, but they're going to leave the opposite side up. Oh, well, it, well, it just depends. I don't know. Probably they've not got to that yet, you see. Most of the existing houses in the area were basically sound. Some were respectable, well-cared-for terraces, others in need of repair and attention, but not hopeless cases. But while demolition went on, the council met residents to discuss rehousing. I want a bungalow, I want a bungalow. You want, well, you want I, want, I want a home of my own, I don't want a flat. Well, a flat I'm to me isn't a, a home of your own. No, quite, but I'm, I'm afraid this is going to be very difficult. Well, where do you want to go? I want to go to Worsley Court. Worsley Court. And they're putting me out of my house, and I don't see why I shouldn't go where I want to go. Well, by all means, we're going to try and fix you up at Worsley Court. I hope you are. Because yes. I'm not going out, they can bulldoze me in. Well, that's all right. They didn't bulldoze her in, but they did complete demolition. 
what went up in its place was the largest housing development of its kind in Europe. But the council made so little effort to maintain this new utopia that when the Lord Mayor paid a visit to it, he met a hostile welcome. I don't know, honestly, when you've got kids, you do nothing. You're living in bugman places here. And I'm not joking, I've never seen them before in my life, so I've come to live here. And because of ceramic walling, they should spend nearly every place is going to end up with bugs, besides living in fire hazards. And this is what they put people that always lived in decent housing in. What are you walking away for? Is the truth urging? He had one, darling. It's a gimmick. Nothing yes. but a gimmick. This row was untypical. Most people just put up with such conditions without protest. And it's a bitter irony that these already decaying concrete monoliths are far less well-built and far less adaptable than the modest houses they replaced, yet they will be almost impossible to demolish. We take a hard heart not to admit that we should do everything in our power to preserve existing communities and people's own homes, and the argument often ends up being just about that. But in the case of industrial buildings, like warehouses and docks, Developers ask, what case can there be for keeping purpose-built structures after their intended use is gone? The result, most cities have areas like London's Dockland, left to rot while planners and developers argue what should replace them. But elsewhere, a bit of imagination and usually voluntary effort has been applied to finding new uses for such buildings. Old churches whose congregations have gone, like Hawksmoor's Christ Church at Spitalfields in London, end up derelict, unless like Holy Trinity across the river in Southwark, they're converted to some new use. In this case, a rehearsal hall for the London Philharmonic. And warehouses, like this one at Northampton, which Carlsberg wants to pull down, have elsewhere been adapted with great success. Like this clock mill at Bromley by Bow, which Charrington's have turned into offices, and thereby saved both the building and some money. Areas like this remind us clearly that cities need jobs and trade to make the homes and transport and other amenities that support them really economic. Rotherhithe used to be one of the busiest dockland areas in London, and in the 19th century its warehouses burst at the seams with Britain's imperial trade. Yet, when containerization of the docks came in, places like Rotherhithe were not adapted to it as they might have been. Instead, new docks were built downstream at Tilbury, leaving miles of this area obsolete and forcing the local dockers to commute. As for the buildings themselves, the most precious amongst them, like the cluster around St. Mary's Church, were enough to have it designated as an outstanding conservation area. One of the driving forces behind the attempt to rescue Rotherhithe is Nicholas Falk of the Industrial Building Preservation Trust, who's working on restoring and adapting a number of local warehouses and Brunel's engine house for his tunnel under the Thames. Nicholas, looking around at the sort of desolation that surrounds us, it'd be very hard for an ordinary person to imagine why it should be saved at all, let alone declared a conservation area and an outstanding one at that. Mm. How did you manage to persuade anyone that this should be uh, so designated? I think the, uh, you, you're right that the individual buildings perhaps are not exceptional, but the character of the area comes from the relationship between the various buildings, the tight enclosed spaces, the contrast between the warehouses and the church poking through. Uh, it's that sort of picture that I think is very important and, and unusual. Remember, when this area was designated about five years ago, it was a very different sort of area. Five years ago, the buildings were just empty. And what tends to happen in this area, or any other area for that matter, is kids begin to break in, then people realize the sled on the roofs, and gradually the the buildings begin to decay, and then the process of decay comes very fast, and people give up. People who once might have said they'd like to see the buildings kept if they could be turned to new uses, look at them and say, we don't want to live in a derelict area like this. For goodness sake, just pull it down. Because the one thing people can't stand of all classes is waste. And when they know that there's no space for kids to play, there's no community center, and they can see empty buildings and empty sites lying idle, they get angry, and rightly so. 
How does planning law function in this situation? Is it a help or a hindrance? Well, there's no law that stops an area deteriorating. But once you start to change things, when you start to change the use of the buildings, when you start to do any building work, then the law comes down in full force. And so what at first seemed like a cheap and easy scheme in the end becomes an impossible task. What about cost, actually, in, in the case of your workshops and so on? I mean, how would that compare to knocking it down and building them new? Well, our calculations show that it's going to be significantly cheaper than building afresh. Our rents will be about £1.50 a square foot, um, about £3 a week for the average workshop, if all things work out. And that would only be possible by using an old building. What are really the range of activities that you hope to see here? And who else is doing what sort of schemes? Mm. Well, talking about the workshops, first of all, the first tenants that are moving in include potters, model makers, glass blowers, uh, furniture restorers, violin makers, there's going to be a timber bank of rare woods, dance studio, a whole range of, uh, of small-scale activities. Elsewhere in the area, there are a number of interesting projects that are now taking place. There's a little theatre, for example. There are some design studios. Just here, the house is, this warehouse is being converted into uh, living accommodation for somebody who's setting up a picture reference library in an old warehouse, and also more workshops. This time for making models and dolls' houses and things like that. Uh, the warehouse over there is uh, being converted into flats. And uh, if they get planning permission, that project will go ahead quite soon. The problem of adapting warehouses to new uses can be seen in the ideas proposed for Thames Tunnel Mills, or what's left of it, after three fires in the last two years. The architects want to convert it to housing, but because it's so wide, there's a daylight problem in the middle. Their solutions are simple and straightforward. The first plan was for luxury flats on split levels which created extra window space. Southwark Council disliked the idea of expensive private housing and turned it down. The next plan hollowed out the centre to provide more light and followed standard council flat designs to provide six family flats on every floor. This too was rejected, so there's now a plan to build for single people, which copes with a light problem by putting the artificially lit bathrooms and kitchens in the central core and the bed sitters on the outside. But in the end, doesn't conservation stand in the way of commercial progress? Our towns have always grown to prosperity on successive waves of rebuilding. When the magic words office block or shopping centre are pronounced, permission to demolish becomes almost automatic. But old buildings can represent more than just beauty and history. They're the result of past spending of human effort, of raw materials and of energy, which it now costs more and more to replace. We pay a lot of attention these days to the conservation of natural resources, Yet we still pull down buildings whose replacement cost in these terms is immense. The collapse of the property boom is not just the result of economic recession. As the price of new building rises, we simply cannot afford not to conserve the old. This argument has recently been strengthened by the failure of the big redevelopments of the 50s and 60s. Then it was argued that economic growth and a beautiful city meant building new and building big. But look at London's Euston Centre, where a celebrated office development replaced a busy street market with this. It was meant to be a retail shopping arcade, but building costs pushed the rent so high, the traders now can't afford to move back. The space stands bleak and unused. And across the road in Tolmers Square, even council redevelopment will mean the end of 105 small businesses, which provide a thousand jobs. Yet to this false god of more office blocks, we're still proposing to sacrifice such lovely buildings as the City Club in London's Old Broad Street and the magnificent vault of Liverpool Street Station. But restoring such a building isn't only a social benefit. It can actually make a healthy profit. This comes not only from reusing the existing fabric, but more and more from cutting out the immense delay which now surrounds all big demolition and redevelopment schemes. And this has been as true in a booming market as it now is in a poor one. At Lawrence Pountney Hill in the City of London, one private developer with a speciality in conservation, Hazelmere Estates, has most successfully shown how. It must have cost a lot of money to do all this work. Uh, did you really make a profit out of it? Yes, we made a profit out of it, uh, and we find that anything that is done well is profitable. A new building of the 
quality that we're in here now would probably cost about 40 pounds a foot to build. Uh, to do a very good restoration would probably cost about 25 pounds a square foot. Can you give an example of, of differential rents? Yes, I would say uh, in some cases, uh, building for building, it is perhaps uh, as much as a pound a foot higher for a, a really first class building that's been restored. I think there are many occupiers who would sooner have their own front door and their own building in preference to the 19th floor of some very large building. In this program, we've tried to demolish the arguments put forward to justify the pulling down of sound existing buildings, especially historic ones. We hope we've demonstrated that it rarely makes sense in economic terms, let alone in human terms, or in terms of conservation of energy and resources. But what can we do to change the situation which is described in the SAVE report, in which so many priceless and useful buildings are still under threat? There are a number of practical steps we can take at once, if the government means what it has said recently about supporting conservation. First, it can change the silly regulations which work against it. All new construction is zero rated for VAT, while conversions are charged the full rate. This penalty should be eliminated, if not reversed, so people are encouraged to conserve. Building societies rarely give mortgages on old houses. They should be made to do so as a condition for any government help. Any cuts in council spending should fall on costly new projects and not council mortgages and grants for rehabilitation. But most important of all, threatened buildings should be presumed worth saving unless their owners can prove that demolition and replacement is economically desirable. I sat on the Dobry Committee that recommended this at the government's own urgent request some 14 months ago. Unhappily, they have just turned it down as too expensive of staff time. So much conservation is not expensive. It does require speed and flexibility from developers and local authority planners. These proposals and others in the report could be taken effectively tomorrow and would be a proper way to celebrate European Architectural Heritage Year. We can't afford to let this tragic waste of our resources and history continue. And we must not forget that like great paintings slashed by vandals, the words priceless, invaluable, irreplaceable apply to the best of the architecture still at risk. And finally, we bring you some good news, an example which illustrates all we've been saying tonight. It's an example of an area once doomed, now rescued. Everyone watching ought to be able to recognize it.